during the interview interval. In the process, the Wurstbergers claimed to have discovered a number of new elements of consciousness, um, including conscious sets, awareness, thoughts. In the English language literature, these are often collectively termed imageless thoughts, and the debate between Wundt and the Wurstbergers as the imageless, Im imageless thought controversy. Wundt referred to the Wurzburger studies as sham experiments and criticized them vigorously. Wundt's most significant English student, Edward Bradford Tischner, then working at Cornell, intervened in the dispute, claiming to have conducted extended introspective studies in which he was able to resolve the Wurzburger's imageless thoughts into sensations, feelings, and images. He thus paradoxically, paradoxically used a method of which Wundt did not approve in order to affirm Wundt's view of the situation. The imageless thought debate is often said to have been instrumental in undermining the legitimacy of all introspective methods in experimental psychology and ultimately in bringing about the behaviorist revolution in American psychology. It was not without its own delayed legacy, however. Herbert A. Simon, 1981, cites the work of one Wurzburg psychologist, in particular Otto Zels, for having inspired him to develop his famous problem-solving computer al algorithms. <clears throat> logic theorist and general problem solver, and his thinking out loud method for protocol analysis. In addition, Karl Popper studied psychology under Bueller and Sells and appears to have brought some of their influence un unattributed to his philosophy, philosophy of science. What a tongue twister. Now, basically what you're seeing is the debate between the Würzburg School and Karl Wundt and how they're both Germans who have different ideas. You see this in the white power philosophy all the time. You see it in Nazism versus the Ku Klux Klan, the left versus the right. You see it in the European War, Hundred Year War, the World War II, where the white racists will disagree among themselves about their greater white racist philosophy, which is incorrect and is based on false premises and logical fallacies. I now most of you can tell that the argument that I don't know what I'm talking about is completely irrelevant for many reasons because all the things they are talking about you know it comes from the ancient papyri in English where psychology comes from in the first place I study English it went to Greece I studied Greece it has to do with secret societies it has to do with German schools of thought I studied those things it has to do with levels of consciousness intellect ego human behavior sociology, psychology, physiology, metaphysics, astronomy, etc. Now, we go to Gestalt psychology. Whereas the Wurzburgers debated with Wundt mainly on matters of method, another German movement centered in Berlin took issues with a widespread assumption that the aim of psychology should be to break consciousness down into putative basic elements. Instead, they argued that the psychological whole has priority and that the other parts are defined by the structure of the whole rather than vice versa. Thus the school was named Gestalt, a German term meaning approximately form or configuration. It was led by Max Wertheimer, Wolfgang Kohler, and Kurt Kafka. Wertheimer had been a student of Austrian philosopher Christian von Ersenwels. Now, if you truly understand and you go into the history of all these individual people, you'll see they're almost all Eurocentric people who have a point to prove. Now, who, anyway, going on, who claim that in addition to the sensory elements of a perceived object, there is an element which, though in some sense derived from the organization of the standard sensory elements, is also to be regarded as being an element in its own right. He called this extra element gestalt qualitat. It is the presence of this gestalt qualitat, which according to von Erdfels, allows a tune to be transposed to a new key using completely different notes, but still retain its identity. Wertheimer took the more radical line that what is given me by the melody does not arise as a secondary process from the sum of the pieces as such. Instead, what takes place in each single part already depends on what the whole is. In other words, one hears the melody first and only when perceptually divided up into, into only then made perceptually divided up into notes. Similarly, in vision, one sees the form of the circle first 
It is given immediately. It is not meditated by a process of part assumption. Only after this primary apprehension might one notice that it is made up of lines or dots or stars. Gestalt theory was officially initiated in 1912 in an article by Wertheimer on the phenom phenomena, uh, the five phenomenon, a perceptional illusion in which two stationary but alternately flashing lights appear to be a single light moving from one location to another. Contrary to popular opinion, his primary target was not behaviorism, as it was not yet a force in psychology. The aim of his criticism was rather that the at atomistic uh, psychologies of Hermann von Helmholtz, Wilhelm Wundt, and other European psychologists of the time. The two men who served as Weitmeimer's subjects in the Phi experiment were Kohler and Kafka. Kohler was an expert in physical acoustics, having studied under physicist Max Planck, but had taken his degree in psychology under Karl Stumpf. Kafka was also a student of Stumpf's, having studied movement phenomena and psychological aspects of rhythm. In 1917, Kohler published the results of four years of research on learning in chimpanzees. Kohler studied, contrary to the claims of most learning theorists, that animals, had, animals can learn by sudden insight into the structure of a problem, over and above the associative and incremental manner of learning that Ivan Pavlov and Edward Lee Thorndike had demonstrated with dogs and cats, respectively. The terms structure and organization were focal for the gestalt psychologists. Stimuli were said to have a certain structure to be organized in a certain way. And it is to this structural organization, rather than to individual sensory elements, that the organism responds. When an animal is conditioned, it does not simply respond to the absolute properties of a stimulus. Quote, unquote, that, I mean, in parentheses, that's just fucking stupid, right? but to its properties relative to its surroundings. To use a favor favorite example of Kohler's, if conditioned to respond in a certain way to the lighter of two gray cards, the animal generalizes the relation between the two stimuli rather than the absolute properties of the conditioned stimulus. It will respond to the lighter of the two cards in subsequent trials, even if the darker card in the test trial is of the same intensity as the lighter one in the original training trials. Now, basically what that trial is telling you in scientific terms is that it's not just this one stimulus in the, in the brain that's, that's going on. Rather, it's the stimulus of the environment and the relationship to what's going on in the environment that makes the animal respond in that specific manner. Now, in 1921, Kafka published a gestalt-oriented text on developmental psychology, growth of the mind, with the help of American psychologist Robert Ogden. Kafka introduced the gestalt point of view to an American audience in 1922 by a way of a paper in Psychological Bulletin. It contains criticism of then current explanations of a number of problems of perception and the alternatives offered by the Gestalt School. Kafka moved to the United States in 1924, eventually settled at Smith College in 1927. In 1935, Kafka published his Principles on Gestalt Psychology. This textbook laid out the Gestalt vision of the scientific enterprise as a whole. Science, he said, is not the simple accumula accumulation of facts. What makes research scientific is the incorporation of facts into a theoretical structure. The goal of the gestalt, gestaltist was to integrate the facts of inanimate nature, life, and mind into a single scientific structure. This means that science would have, swa would have swallowed not only what Kafka called the quantitative facts of physical science, but the facts of two other scientific categories, questions of order and questions of sin. A German word which has been variously trans, uh, translated as significance, value, and meaning. Without incorporating the meaning of experience and behavior, Kafka believed that science would doom itself to trivialities in its investigation of human beings. Hmm. Huh. Interesting what he believes and what I end up believing they have happen modern day. But anyway, having survived the onslaught of the Nazis, one of my main arguments is this has to do with World War II and the schools of thought that World War II produced and the schools of thought that created World War II in the first place. Anyway, having survived the onslaught of the Nazis up to the mid-1930s, all the core members of the Gestalt movement were forced out of Germany to the United States by 1935. 
hmm, when I say to my way back when in my original psychiatry, is it started here, and it moved here, and it went back here. But anyway, going on. Kohler published another book, Dynamics in Psychology, in 1940, but thereafter, the Gestalt movement suffered a series of setbacks. Kafka died in 1941 and Wertheimer in 1943. Wertheimer's long-awaited book on mathematical problem-solving productive thinking was published posthumously in 1945, but Kohler was left out to guide the movement without his two long-time colleagues. Oh, how heartbreaking. Anyway, as a result of the conjunction of a number of events in the early 20th century, behaviorism gradually emerged as the dominant school in American psychology. Now, can we please repeat that for all the idiots out there who have the nerve to put their stupid point of view which pollutes the world and not realize what the psychologists themselves are saying. As a result of the conjunction of a number of events, exactly what I said, as a result of a conjunction of a number of events, exactly what I said all my life, in the early 20th century, all my life, behaviorism gradually emerged as the dominant school in American psychology. So what happened? One European school of thought in specific, which was cultivated mostly in Germany, like I've always argued, that has to do with Nazism, like I always argued, which has to do with the sentimentism, the sentiments and the philosophies of Nazi Nazism, which I've always argued, became the dominant school in American psychology, which I always argued, which influenced psychiatry, which I've always argued. Now, first among these were the increasing skepticism with which many view the concept of consciousness, although still considered to be the essential element separating psychology from physiology. Now, these people who know nothing about religion, whose religion came 30,000 years after the first African religious artifacts, matter of fact, these people came into existence 30,000 years after the first African artifacts about religion came into, you know, were found, and, you know, were, were dated to. Now, they're going to tell you about religion, about consciousness, and about the nature of man. And they're going to take over the world, and they're going to force you to do it their way. It's always been my argument. And that's not only has that been my argument, that, that, that's, I've argued that's what we're seeing happening right now. Period. Now, when we go to, um, back to where we left off, it, physiology now, it talks about its subjective, subjective nature and the unreliable introspective method it seemed to require troubled many. Hmm including me. Now, William James, 1904, Journal of Philosophy. Article called, Does Consciousness Exist? So, psychiatry was coined in 1808. In 1904, they're still wondering if consciousness even exists. When consciousness as a science has been this part of religion, and you know, a, a basic fundamental part of religion, all throughout man's existence. And, there's, and the psychiatrists are still wondering if it still exists with their psychologist buddies. Oh. Now, second was the gradual rise of a rigorous animal psychology. In addition to Edward Lee Thorndike's work with cats in puzzle boxes in 1898, the start of research in which rats learned to navigate mazes was by William Small. Now, these morons are so dumb, they need to do experiments on animals to what common sense will tell you already. Now, Robert M. Yerkes, 1905 Journal of Philosophy article Animal Psychology Attribute Consciousness to an Organism. The following year saw the emergence of John Brodus Watson, who was a major player publishing his dissertation on the relation between neurological development and learning in the white rats. Oh! Another important rat study. See, there are a bunch of rats studying rats. The irony just kills me. It's hard not to be completely skeptical and to be a wise ass about it when you truly, when you, you know, you're hearing what I'm saying. You probably feel the same way by now. Now, a third factor was the rise of Watson to a position of significant power with the psychological community. In 1908, Watson was offered a junior position at John Hopkins. Now, remember, all these guys like Wilhelm, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, had to do with eugenics, had to do with World War II. Man, anyway, go, going back to this. Baldwin was the editor of the influential journal Psychological Review and the Psychological Bulletin, only months after Watson's arrival. Baldwin was forced to resign his professorship due to scandal. Why am I not surprised that all these people who are the forefathers of behavioral psychology are forced to retire from different universities for scandal? Universities that cover up scandal made them resign because their scandal was so scandalous that even their scandalous ass wouldn't put up with it. But anyway, going on um you know what i'm gonna end it there and i'm gonna finish the one in the next video keep it simple